Let me just say for the benefit, I've said it over and over again, I do believe in slavery. You have to, it's inevitable. Paul says in Romans, you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. You're not going to escape that. We've been bought with a price if we are a child of God. We've been paid for. We are owned by God. And so that kind of slavery we believe in. And the rest of it, we just simply do not want to get into the doctrines and the practices of men, which are so foolish. And we have seen the church go off many times on these issues. But we're not ashamed to say we are a constitutional people. And we believe in the founding document of this country. And so those things which related to, in particular, Southern culture and practice politically, the Presbyterian Church, and all of that political understanding of our nation versus the Northern National Socialist Programs, the National Collectivisms, those things which Lincoln himself espoused, we do not agree with. And we're seeing the effects of that even to this day. And if you didn't know it, time to wake up. You're also owned economically by your government in this country. They have economically enslaved you to their system. And there's only one of two ways to get out of it. That is, don't pay your taxes and go to jail or die. You are in bondage here and now. I don't like it. You shouldn't like it. None of us should like any type of slavery, including slavery to sin. But we ought to love being slaves to Christ. He has set us free from the bondage of sin. As Jason was pointing out, the glory of of what God has done for us in Christ because our job is to extol the glory of God, of his holiness, of his uniqueness. There is no other God like unto him. But in the midst of all of that holiness, one of the great, great stories of redemption is our God buys us through Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel that has been preached. He brings us to himself as his children or slaves to do righteousness, slaves to follow what God has called us to follow. And so I exhort you let us all be good slaves unto our Lord. Let us serve with love, with honor, with dignity. For he has given the greatest price that can be paid for our lives. And we owe him that much. And the rest, you simply know that is worldly things that are not named among the church of Christ. Now, we're going back to our series, Written with the Finger of God. We're about to wind up this whole series on the law of God. We've dealt with the Ten Commandments. And last Lord Day, we were into sermon number 127, now at Sermon 128, and we're going to finish what we started. We're dealing with the question concerning the law of God. Now, our sermon text was Deuteronomy 9, 10 through 11. 
Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. May we look to the Lord our God in prayer. Our Holy Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to again examine your word, your teaching to us. Teach us, O oh God, how to live the life as your child. To live and strive to keep your law. But to face the reality of the issues that we have because we have not yet been perfected. But the day is coming. There's a day out there coming when we will no longer know sin. Because we have been redeemed and we are going to be eternally glorified in our Lord Jesus Christ. We look for that day, O oh God. We look for that day, no matter what suffering we do here, as Paul says, cannot compare to the glory of eternity with you. And so God bless us, strengthen us, keep us in thy righteousness. Teach us about your holiness and our duty to honor you with integrity. Our design is in you and our Lord Jesus Christ in particular, for the work that he has done. And so we ask, Father, be with us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive that which thy word and spirit would teach us in this hour. In Christ's name, amen. Now, the question we were looking at with the Issue of the law of God was this, question number 149 by the Westminster Divines. Is any man able perfectly to keep the commandment of God? And they answered in this question, 149, no man is able. No man, because of original sin, the fall of Adam into sin, we said, no man is able to keep the law of God. You're commanded to be obedient. Adam was in the garden. He was bound to the commands of God. Yet he violated them. Since then, no man is able to keep the law of God of God. So you can't be saved by keeping the law. Neither can you be sanctified because that's a work of God's grace in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a part of the saving graces God gives to you at the point of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. So they say no man is able, either of himself, through his own ability, his own will, his own power, or by any grace received in this life. Being born again by the Spirit of God, being one to Christ through the grace that God has given to us in his death, the application of of his blood, his righteousness, that alien righteousness by which we can stand reunited with God will not in this life be able to keep us from sinning. They went on to stay perfectly, that is to keep the commandments of God. 
but doth daily break them. Whether you're a believer or not, whether you are one who says that you are a slave to Christ or you're a slave to sin, you don't even have an idea of what it means to be a slave to Christ. You're not going to keep the law of God perfectly. And thus we cannot but daily break them and they say, that is in both thought, in word, and in deed. Things which we think, things which we say, things which we do. This is an important point that we wanted to make last week. And you're never surprised when we or another Christian, or a non-believer violates the commandment of God. No one's able to perfectly keep them. It does not mean as Christians we are not commanded to strive toward keeping the law of God. We are to be wholly set aside like our God is. Be ye holy, for I am holy, is the command. Thus, the general principle that is being laid out here is simply this. To keep the law of God perfectly would require us to produce constant and continual obedience to all the commandments of God as he has laid out for us as we have looked at them in their detail, but not exhaustingly, over the last two years, we've been going through these commandments. Think about all the things that we have covered. Constant, continual obedience is the only way that you can perfectly keep the law of God. can't be done by man. Man is in sin, and even in his redeemed state, still has a remnant of sin that he has to deal with. Thus, he's required to mortify sin in his life, and progressive sanctification is to grow in the grace of God so that we continue to become more mature and more spiritual about the things of God and the way that we live out our life. He's seen that in Ecclesiastes 7, 9, truly this only have I found that God made man upright, but they man have sought out many schemes. So we put the emphasis on the fact that you must strive to keep the law of God. It's commanded. There are no options here. But you shouldn't be surprised that you will have to deal with the fact that you will fail throughout this life in perfect obedience to the commands. But as believers, we have a righteous one that we can go to. We can go to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our intercessor for us and we are to seek forgiveness of our transgressions. A believer, that's an earmark. A true believer is so in awe of the holiness of our God 
that his biggest desire in life is not how much money I can make, how much honor I can be given in this life, is how I may glorify God. But that really is something I need from him. I must go to my intercessor. I must go to him who has saved me by his grace, filled me with his spirit, given me the ability in the power of his spirit, not my own ability, not my own when I'm not a believer and not mine when I am a believer, but in the power of God's grace. What is his central focus? I must flee from sin. I heard it said, well, one time, The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? I don't know anybody who does want to go to heaven. I don't know if you've read about the other place, but nobody wants to go there. I'll guarantee you that. But that's not the question. The question is, do you want to be saved from your sins? Do you want to walk in the calling of God and his righteousness? Is that your desire as a believer? I've heard all kinds of answers to that question. I grew up in a church that that was the popular thing. Want to go to heaven? Here's the four spiritual laws that take you down the Romans road, or as I called it, the Galilean alley. And they give you all those little things and they say, now say this prayer. Okay, you did it. You're on your way to heaven. Out they go. Maybe never darken the door of the church again, but assuring them you got saved which is not the case at all. The question is not, do you not want to go to hell, but want to go to heaven? But do you want to really deal with sin in your life? Do you want out of the bondage of darkness, that kingdom with no light, the end thereof, which is Literally, the flames and fire of God's condemnation and hell. Or do you want to be free from that sin that condemns you? Do you want to serve Christ with the great hope that one day in eternity we will be with him forever? Do you want to deal with your sin? Read Ephesians chapter 1. God saved you to be a holy, righteous people. Didn't say in there. Didn't save you so you would not go to hell but go to heaven. That's a byproduct. The real issue is sin in your life. You want to be a slave to sin? Or do you want to be a slave to Christ? And so that was our emphasis that what we were looking at last Lord's Day. Now I want to come back because I simply said to you that the scripture chronicles the sins of some very celebrated saints who have sinned and they know the struggle. Just as we as Christians should know the struggle of sin in our life. But they also knew that they had to war with it. They could not speak peace to it 
They had to go to war with sin in their lives. Why? Why do you have to be at war with sin? Because that is one of the great evidences in your life. The law of God being that standard of righteousness which says to us, I am pursuing the high calling of God and my Lord. We will face daily issues of sin. Sometimes we sin without really consciously thinking about it. And yet at the same time, sometimes we sin with a willing intent to deceive or to do wrong unto our God and to ourself and or our neighbor. Well, such illustrious saints, such as Abraham, we're told in Genesis 22. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Remember, the question was, Abraham, who is this? Being fearful that they may kill him if they thought it was his wife, he what? Lies. Well, kind of, because she's kind of his half-sister, according to the teaching of Scripture. But the idea was to deceive. He violates the commandment of God. She's my sister. And Amalek, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And then realizes, God reveals to him that this is another man's wife. Even Father Abraham, as great of a saint that he is, sins. Against God. Moses. Remember when Moses got mad? The children of Israel. In Psalm 106, 33, we're told because they rebelled against his spirit, so that he, Moses, spoke rashly with his lips to them. He sinned in his action against the children. Moses, the one who comes as the high prophet of God in the Old Testament, the great prophet of God, and he delivers the law of God that dealt with priests, with all of the ceremonial practices and laws, And yet he sins. A great man. And yet he sins. David, a man after God's own heart. The Bible says David was a man who wanted to follow the heart of God. We're told in Psalm 51.1, which says to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Here is his prayer as a result of his sin. Asking God to blot them out, forgive him for what he has done. David, you know, not one of us has ever been told that you have a heart that desires the heart of God. Not one. I'm telling you, if David was told 
at least to us in the scripture about that. And he said, do not think you're going to be able to live your life without sin. That's not a justification to sin. It's not an excuse for you to sin. But it's the reality of our state in redemption. No perfection this side of heaven. The only one we said was the God-man Jesus Christ. Peter, you got to love this because this is the first pope, according to the Catholic Church. He sinned. And let me tell you, the popes have sinned ever since then. And some of them willingly and heftily. Um, <laughs> some of them had some really unbelievable. You need to know and read the history of the popes. It will be an eye-opener to you. I remember one guy was had a party, there was a lot of ugly, sinful transgressions going on, and they were drinking and just doing all kinds of sins, and he woke up and found out his mom and dad had bought him a papal position. <laughs> That's pretty good. Guess what, son? After this last weekend and everything, we decided the best thing we could do for you is to make you a pope. Did not solve the problem. Peter sins. Matthew 26, 72. But again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man, speaking of Christ. He lied. So we have some really great men chronicled in the history of the church. From the Old Testament through to the New. Men, saints of God. Some of them we are told to look up to. But they still had to deal with sin, even as redeemed men in their lives. You're going to deal with it. Don't be like Adam and run and hide from God and think that he's not going to know. Deal with your sin. Admit it. Don't hide it. Be honest. Confess it. Get forgiveness. Live with a clean conscience as much as you can. You're always going to have to deal with sin. But you have a righteous one you can confess to. And the real sign of your Christianity is the desire to confess it, the desire to live by that righteousness that God has established for us and this the commandments he has given to us. The reality is we'll never keep it perfectly. But on the other hand, we have a righteous one who has kept it. And as a result, we can, through the power, strive to keep his commands to us. Thus, no ordinary man except Christ. Our God-man, Christ Jesus, our Lord is able, able meaning he cannot, it's a word of ability. He cannot by his own ability, or if you will, an act of his will, perfect his life by keeping the law of God perfectly. Cannot be done. But we are called in Christ to walk in our sanctification and strive towards that aspect of what perfection would be.
that means there's a lot of work you have to do. Oh, it's so much easier if somebody says, hey, you're saved, you're sanctified. Well, declaratively, we are. You're not perfected. So you have to strive toward the progression of sanctification. And you do on the negative side by the mortification of sin. But it's so easy when someone says, you know what? The law of God's gone now in your life. You can do anything you want to do. I've told you this before. There's an old Methodist hymn to some extent goes like this. Oh, free from the law, oh, blessed condition, sin as I will and still have remission. But the reality is, there is no sin in their theory of things. If there's no law, there can be no sin. For sin is the transgression of the law. That would mean you're living a perfect life. That's not what the scripture chronicles in the lives of the saints of God. It's not what we've been called to in our lives. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is a very clear understanding of God's purpose in redemption. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that's the instrument, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, not something you can do, but it is God who is at work in you by his power, lest anyone should what? Be able to boast. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. We are not our own workmen and living in our own workmanship. But we are his workmanship, created how? In Christ Jesus Christ. For what purpose? Here he reveals it again. For good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As our catechism states, clearly we're going to have an issue with sin all the days of our life. In thought, word, and deed. We even do it in our state of sleep. We will find ourselves with thoughts or dreams, things that come to us. The result of things that we've either done or seen in our life that we should not have been involved in. Sometimes it was things that happened years ago and Satan for some reason just likes to show you the old pictures or show you the old whatever you were watching or reading. He just loves to replay it all the time. It's kind of like people who love gum with the wind. They watched it hundreds of times. Can remember, almost cite it word for word or any of those kind of things. Satan has a wonderful way of trying to deal with us, trying to get us to violate the law of God, to sin against God. So sometimes we do it consciously. I'm not going to say we do it unconsciously, but we do it on our sleep state. Because during our sleep state, our focus in daily walk is now blended with past thoughts, current thoughts, and sometimes I still think some of my dreams throughout my life would have made great movies. Matter of fact, I've dreamed of creatures that I thought would have been great for science fiction movies. Just all kinds of things. Because you don't have your focus on your duty and your calling. You're not awake. You're at rest. And your conscience and the historical thoughts, the historical things you've read. You know what the Bible says is so true. As a man thinketh, so he is. And it will even come into his sleep state. What do you do? You get up and you confess it to God.
no matter what state. Even if you were delirious, and if you said things that should have not been said, once you know that that was the case, what do you do? You confess your sin. That's the whole point. Psalm 50, 21 says, These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. When we indulge ourselves in the flesh, in our pride, when we coddle ourselves in those evil thoughts about our neighbor, when we break the commandments in words, or even if it's utter, idle, unprofitable words towards someone else. It's a telling story of your life. You know what you do? You confess it. You make it right. If you violated someone, the real story of a Christian is he makes it right. I should have never opened my mouth and said what I said. I sinned against you. Therefore, I sinned against God because it was his command for me not to do that. We cannot be involved in unprofitable thoughts, words, or deeds in our life as Christians. In Matthew 12, 36, we're told, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. Remember when we grew up, you heard those little ditties that we used to sing or say, six and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yes, they do. But you got to consider the caliber of the person who said them. He's the one violating the law of God. He's betraying himself, really showing himself for who he is. Do you want to live in that state? Do you want to live in a state in which you are involved in sin in your life? What does it say about your life? I don't care what you say about your life in your word. You can say, well, I'm a Christian, but if you violate the law of God with impunity, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how articulate you are. But if you're living in sin, my friend, you're not in Christ and you're in danger of hell. But we who are in Christ, we're still going to sin. But what do we do? We seek forgiveness. We confess it. We make it right. Both with God and with our neighbor. Psalm 73, 9 says, they set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. We must be careful that we do not break these commandments. We must not violate any of these commandments that God has given to us. The hard part is we've got to look at these commandments and say, wow, this is the summation of the law. We've looked at the details of the law to some extent, not exhaustively. And you've got to ask yourself a question. How in the world do I do this? I mean, if you had a, a notebook, it'd be filled up with all the things you're not supposed to do. And you'd be flipping through it, looking. What do I do here? What do I do here? We learn the divines teach us 
that through the catechism, we can learn how to live our life. We can realize things we ought not be involved in. Once we are illumined to them, once we read them, once we study the law of God, once we are committed to live our life in a way that is not sinful, but is law-keeping, dwelling upon the commandments. Dwelling upon the whole story of what God has done in Christ for us. Forgiveness of sin, but not a state of perfection. The reality of sin, it's there. How do you eliminate sin? Well, of course, you've got to confess it. But that doesn't eliminate it. What eliminates sin? Learning how to live the law of God out in your life. And you cannot do it through your own power. You must seek God's power through his spirit. We must constantly seek to glorify God. We must guard ourselves against all sin. And we have got to mortify the deeds of the flesh. We may even avoid all occasions of sin. Resist all temptations. Yet, were it not for the restraining grace of God, we would, in, with impunity, violate the law of God through our sinful transgressions. From that remaining aspect of corruption that is in our nature. We had an old man that was crucified with Christ and a new man comes forward. His desire has changed. His want to has changed. The things he once wanted in life are no longer the things he wants. Now he wants to walk with God spiritually. To do that, you've got to get into the word of God and especially you've got to look at the law of God and how it affects your life. Nevertheless, we have to say thanks be to our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that for his sake we have been freed from the reigning, that is enslaving power of sin in Christ and are kept from the complexities of those sins which bring shame to the name and integrity of our holy God. Spirit of God, if he indwells you, ought to be pushing you to do the law of God, to keep it morally, to persevere in it, which is the ultimate goal and duty of every believer. Well, let me leave you with this scripture text. Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, 4, 3 through 4, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. This is the will of God, that you be sanctified. Whatever decision you make in life, the question has got to be as a Christian, will I be sanctified if I do this? I've told people for years, before you decide to move your family to a far nether region that your company wants to transfer you to, and you find out there is no church there that preaches the gospel, you cannot go. How would that add to your sanctification? Well, it might add to your bank account, but it does not add to your sanctification. God's will is that you be sanctified, a sanctified saint. Something that most people don't like to hear in those messages. Not in our generation. They're happy clapping. 
Don't ruin our life. Don't tell us those things that we do not want to hear. We don't want to hear about our failures. We don't want to hear about our sins. We don't want to hear about having to confess them. We don't want to hear how, about how to persevere in Christ, which is a calling of God in his grace. They just don't want to hear about it. But God's will is for sanctification. And then he goes on to say that you should obtain from sexual immorality that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, both sexually and in your regular life. How are you to live? What honor is there to be given unto God in the way that you are pursuing sanctification? Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Paul says in Romans, do not let sin have mastery over you. And isn't that really the question? We've studied the law of God, not because we academically want to know what the law of God said. We studied it because we have a command to live by God's moral law. The moral law, the one that says this is how you live your life before God and you glorify him. We need to check our passions, our lust, the desires that we have that are not based in scripture, based upon our own flesh. And we need to be smart enough to do what Peter told us to do. Daily make your calling and the election sure to God. In other words, you better daily be, because you have to deal with sin in your life, you better be really making sure that God has called you and you're part of the elect. You're part of those called out ones. How would you check that? It's the way you live. You were created to walk in his righteousness. We are to be holy like he is holy. Are you walking and living your life that way? I never said, are you perfecting your life so that there is no sin? It's an impossibility. I'm just asking, are you having a desire within yourself to go to war with sin in your life and to make that your chief end in order that God will add all those other things of his kingdom to your life. Because I guarantee you, if you're not, you better be checking your calling and election of God. May God help us to examine ourselves in our life that we can be assured we are warriors. Warriors for Christ against sin in our lives. Seeking to honor him, to glorify him in all that we do. Let us bow our heads in prayer.